Better to have a short life that is full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way. Welcome to the world. Today we have a very special guest connected to us through Kim DeCesar, if you remember from episode 22. Sarah Ugeo has played with Standard Liege, Olympique de Marseille, PSV, as well as the Belgian national team. In addition, she has conducted research on the impact of sport on social relations and community development, which was accompanied by field work in Senegal. Her story of determination, passion, and selflessness makes this episode a must listen. Hope you enjoy. So welcome to Footwork, Sarah. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Happy so um, just, just to give some people some background on who you are, where you're from, uh, maybe just the early beginnings of, of football in your life, um, give, us, give us the spiel, I guess. Uh, yeah, so I'm born in, I was born in Belgium and I've basically lived in Belgium most of my life. Um, and I started playing football on a military base where my mum worked and where we went to school my brother and I. Mm-hmm. Um, I started at five years old with football and at the same time we were also doing basketball. My dad at the time was a basketball coach so those were the two sports and then uh, my brother decided to play in a club outside of the base and I followed him because I basically followed him <laughs> everywhere at that point and, um, and yeah and that's how I got into it. Nice. Basically, yeah. With any older sibling, yeah, I mean, I was the same way. I'm sure Sean was the same way. You yeah. just follow the older sibling. Um, so I didn't – I actually – that's that was a, a interesting point. I didn't know that basketball was, I guess, really even so popular at all. Or did it just happen because your, your father played it? Yeah, I think it just happened uh, because he played, because my uncle also um, played and mm. – the fact that we were on this uh, military base, it's a NATO base, so um, a lot of American uh, influence. And, I, and mm-hmm. so they would offer quite a big um, extracurricular sort of uh, program uh, yeah. in which basketball was. And yeah, my dad started coaching um, as a volunteer. And I guess that's, that's why I can't really remember mm-hmm. the exact uh, moment, but yeah. So following your brother um, in football, was it something that you were drawn to or were you just drawn to because he played it or was it a, was it a bit of both? I mean, I guess it was definitely at first because he played it. So there wasn't really much thought behind it. But then mm-hmm. um, I think I had a certain ability already when I was younger um, mm-hmm. for sports. And then it became slowly became my thing. Mm-hmm. And through the years he he ended up just stopping and I continued so it became, and so, it became mine. <laughs> <laughs> of course and so um I read that you said that until you were 14 you were playing with the boys clubs was that something that was um unique to your experience or did a lot of um girls growing up have to play because of a lack of teams or resources or things like this yeah, in, in Belgium, uh, most girls from my generation would have played with boys. There mm. wasn't enough girls playing at the time to to make girls teams. And even if a club had a girls team, the competition, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be any other girls teams to play against. Mm-hmm. So most of us did grow up playing with the boys and most of us probably stopped around the same age. Because right. that's the age where we could no longer move to the to the upper upper age groups with them, mm-hmm. and that's where we would have to find a, a girls team. Okay, that was a sad moment. Yeah, of course. And so, and so how, then, yeah, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, how how was I would imagine when you go from you know playing with the boys at fourteen to then going onto all girls team was there a drop off in like you felt like the speed of things were so much. Or you were ahead of everyone else compared to the other girls on your team? I remember the first, um, the first feeling, like the first few feelings I had uh, with the, with the girls was I, I, I played right back at that, at that moment. And most of, most of my career, I played midfield, but then I was, I was a right back. And I remember being able to, to just dribble past everyone and, and create actions in front. Like I just felt so much, yeah, I guess physically, more apt 
mm-hmm. um i guess and that that definitely came from the from the boys mm-hmm. for sure i see so how did that transition happen into i mean ultimately you break into some professional squads but in between where it's tough to make that transition when the boys jump to uh, another team so what happened there when that age came about uh wait i don't quite get the question so so just like the in between years before um you know getting into the professional leagues you said there's a time when the boys go off to play with with teams and things like this but the the lack of teams for the girls kind of i guess girls start to to quit and find other things so how what what happened with you so i went on to play with a girls team at 14 so the girls team that was actually in they integrated a girls team within the club a women's team actually mm-hmm. um who were in third division at that point so it was already a national okay. level and so i started playing them playing with them at 15 mm-hmm. um because that's the legal time you can play I, I couldn't play with them at 14 in the league mm-hmm. um and yeah, Division Three, so that was already quite good, and they were actually one of the, the better teams in that in that league. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I didn't stop, and most of those girls would play. I mean, it wasn't it was competitive, but it was mostly more for like what you say in Belgium, the third half, which is mostly okay. You play the game, and then you spend so much time after the match in the in the in the canteen thing or whatever there mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. just uh, it's mostly like team building doing stuff after the game and stuff like mm-hmm. that it's it wasn't it wasn't very like professional it was a great experience but it was yeah and I was also the youngest we were two girls of 15 and the others were I think minimum five years older than us some of them were like 15 or 20 years older older than us even so Oh, okay. Yeah, it was quite a strange. It was it was it was a great experience. I only stayed one year in that club before mm. getting called up to to play in Brussels. Okay. And um, during these during these years did you I mean was it in your mind where you focused that you would try and become a professional or was it something that you weren't really thinking about you were just enjoying your time playing and playing at competitive levels? Yeah, so no, I, I definitely, it took me time to realize actually that I could become professional. So it was definitely more of a hobby, uh, a passion, uh, something that I would do after. So after after school, and then I went on to study uh, university. So it was after university, and then went on to work. So it was what I do after after work. It was the thing after, like the, the thing that you you spend your day thinking of probably but it's not didn't really imagine being able to live um off of it so yeah it right. stayed a hobby for quite a while and then when did it finally become uh your full-time job or what you thought of first it was not the thing on the back burner so that was many years later i after this uh one year my first experience with the girls mm-hmm. i got called up to the team that actually won that league that year so it was a team in Brussels um, where I stayed for seven seasons. What was the name okay. of this club? This is called White Star. Okay, White yeah. Star, it's a team in Brussels. Um, mm-hmm. They used to have a men's team that were went up to second division. Mm-hmm. Uh, now they no longer have a men's team. It's, it's uh, only a women's uh, club and girls. Mm, okay. They have quite a good academy. And uh, yeah, I stayed there, had like built all my, like a huge, nice friends group. It was quite like sort of, um, became sort of my family away from my family. And it was also not far from my school um, that I decided to stay in Belgium and study in Belgium. And yeah, it became comfortable. And I really was not thinking during those, during that time about being a professional. But then the, the league in Belgium changed. So we, we ended up being in first division and played in first division for about six years. Um, we were never at the top. We were usually between, there were like 14 teams and we would usually maybe maximum finish maybe 10th. 
Um, but then, yeah, they changed the league and decided to join with the Netherlands. Okay. So okay. It, they called it the Bene League. Mm -hmm. And so that meant that there was going to be a first division that we were in, but there was a, a, a division above uh, with the Netherlands and the best teams in Belgium would go in there and uh, the teams of the Netherlands. And my club at that time decided not to join. I think there were, there were a lot of... Um, things that they had to do you probably had to pay more money i'm not sure yeah, what the I'm criteria sure. was but they they decided not to go in and that's when i thought no I, I still want to play at the top division like i was comfortable but i was still happy being in the top division mm -hmm. so that's when i decided to change uh, clubs and still be in a club that was in that top that new um that new league mm -hmm. and that's probably when the that's when the switch that's when i switched so you just you thought like i was it was it you you having too much fun competing or you just had a, a drive to to see like how far you could go and that, and who you could play against yeah i i guess yeah i think it, it's that and i was very happy i mean i was happy being the underdog i there's something i love in that and i know a lot of people uh love that underdog thing so i was happy but i like being the underdog uh playing against the top um mm. the top teams so I think that's kind of what drove me to 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 join a team that was joining that league because I want I it was still a team that was quite underdog. We 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 would finish also uh, near near last, but there was still that challenge of being the underdog and trying to 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 develop um, and trying to get some points against those big uh, those big teams. Right now, and and in this new league, was there relegation at the end of the season? No, so it was a project. It was a three-year project, and there would there was no relegation. Like some teams came in, some teams went out, but it mm. was for other reasons. It was mostly financial. Financial reasons, right? Yeah. And how did you how did you find the level, the difference between uh, the league just in Belgium, and then when they combined it to the the yeah. best teams from both? Uh, the first season, you it was clear that the Netherlands had a much higher level. Um, one of our teams, which was our team is called Standard Liège, it's a Belgian team. Mm -hmm. They were they were usually on top with the Ajax, uh, PSV, Twente, and then so you'd have the Belgian team that was within those Dutch teams, all of the Dutch teams, and then all of the Belgian teams. That was basically the first season. That's what it looked yeah, like. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And then the second season, well, that, that time was a bit of a weird time for me because, um, so like I said, I still had to work. I'd finished studying and I still had to work. I started working at this, uh, in, a women's, in a women's shelter, um, which meant that I had to work nights and weekends. Like I had, it really was, wasn't a really good idea to combine that with, uh, with football in retrospect. But I felt like I could do it, and I and I felt like my level at football was was really really good, and I felt like I was developing. And uh, but then I got injured, and probably mainly because I was just tired physically, mm -hmm. um, of running, uh, literally running between uh, between work and football, and not mm -hmm. getting enough rest. Mm -hmm. And I got injured. And quite a bad injury. It was um, I, I tore my my knee my ligaments in my knee, and uh, I thought at that moment I thought that it was over, and I was quite okay with it because I hadn't been a professional and I hadn't really put much thought into being professional. So I was quite okay. I was sad, obviously, but I was quite okay with imagining a life without football. But then, like a month later, that top team I talked about, Standard. Mm -hmm. um called me the coach called me and asked um if i you know if i wanted to come meet with them and to discuss a possible contract with them so i thought wow my first reaction was okay you're crazy like i i just got injured <laughs> and i'm out for like nine months <laughs> why are you calling me um and i was literally um just like kind of hopping i was with my crutches getting on a train to go to my physiotherapy like and they called me on the train and I thought what are you I think you you've mistaken me for someone else 
And they're like, no, no, we, we counted and we'll need you fit for October. So this was in January um, right. because October's Champions League. And I was like, whoa. So I just, I thought, okay, yes, I'll meet with you. Yeah, for sure, definitely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I, it turned football back on in my, in my mind. And, and that was kind of the switch. That was definitely the, the moment where I thought, wow, this is okay. I'm, I'm going to go for it. And how old are you at this moment? uh 2014 so that would make me um 26 okay yeah. all right and i bet i bet that oh. first you said you were on the you're on your way to the physio i bet you worked very hard that first day at the physio trying to get yeah, get ready yeah, yeah, yeah and i worked hard and i actually it didn't take me nine months to get back it took me six months and a half wow, wow. so you're yeah, able to it's... join them in preseason yeah, yeah, actually, wow. yeah. So, so um, playing with so playing with the other teams, yeah. you mentioned you weren't full time professional since you had to, or you chose to, but still you had to have some type of um, working wage, um, working yeah, at a yeah, women's it's shelter. Pocket money, basically. Mm -hmm, okay, but then this transition into this, this was since they were a bigger team and you know participating in things like the Champions League. This was the first full-time thing where you didn't have to do anything on the side or? Um, no, this wasn't full-time. So at that okay. time in Belgium, and even now, actually, I think very few players have full-time um, like contracts with, on which they could actually mm -hmm. live. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was part-time. Okay, this yeah. Professional, professional work contract, but part-time. So mm -hmm. could not, I still had to do something on the side um, in order to live. Does that mean that the trainings were at six or seven o'clock at night? Yeah, trainings were okay. at evenings and Saturday morning. That was that was a fun one. So <laughs> I mean, uh, Friday evenings usually. Okay, I see. So I would love to to talk about that rehab process just a little bit because coming back so soon, I think is, I mean, do do you attribute that to being so focused, working with the right people, and things like this, just having the right mental you know, view of it? Because, you know, when people get injured, it, it can take quite a toll on them. But were you able to see, I uh, have this opportunity, I have something to work towards, and then it made it easier? Um, I think it was a mix of things. It was very new to me that I, I'd never had a bad injury and haven't had an injury um, like that since. So it was a, a new experience, which I think I'm someone that that kind of likes and likes the challenge of a new experience. Mm -hmm. So there was that. There was obviously this call that came quite fast from uh, from the top team, um, and the physios. It was they were two young guys uh, that worked. Uh, it was a partnership that they had with the club I was in at the time. And at that time, so they were really, really good. They were really, really good. A lot of energy, a lot of positivity. And at the time, uh, coincidentally, I think there were four other, um, four other patients that had similar injuries and that were at a similar time. And so we had like a knee group and we would be together. Um, we would be working out together and um, progressing together and also people you can talk to. And it right. all kind of mixed up pretty well. And it, it made this sort of a sort of a harmony that that helped me that helped me progress, I think. Yeah, it was a mix of things. That's awesome. And also, there was a challenge. The challenge is like, when they would say, yeah, um, it's hard for people to regain like a 100% to, like like stretch in their leg and stuff like that. So I would push myself definitely as well for that. And they would mm -hmm. say, yeah, that, that's hard. So I, I, I wanted to push myself. So. Right, you like, to, you like to prove, yeah, you like yeah. to prove. Exactly, yeah. Awesome. So, uh, so you wind up getting back, thankfully, healthy uh, in preseason. How did that first season go? It went, it went, uh, yeah, it, meant, it went amazingly, actually, that season. That was probably, probably the best season, one of the best seasons of my career, for sure. Wow, awesome. Um, because, I mean, the group was great. We, we didn't do well in Champions League, so that was probably the one uh, downfall. But um, the whole experience was great. It got the group, uh, the group really bonded and we were getting results and we ended up winning that, that league. 
So it was the last, that would that was the last year of this uh, project, the Benelik. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we this won. This was the in last... 2015, 2016? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so we won, uh, yeah, we beat all those Dutch teams and, and ended up winning the thing. And it was also for me, like January of that season, I got my first call up to national team, which was quite, I mean, that was quite quick and that was another amazing thing. And that, I mean, I'm 26, so it's quite late to join a team. A lot of those girls were together for, for years before. So, so yeah, all that year was, yeah, that was quite success, successful. Were a lot of those um, girls playing abroad beforehand or were, were some of them, a lot of them still playing in Belgium too? No, I mean, at that time, most of the team were actually in, in, uh, in my team, in, okay. in the Standard team and okay. then a few others um, from around. I'm not sure if that year, I don't think maybe one or two were abroad, but it wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing for us then. It started actually after that when we actually won the Bene League, and then they stopped the Bene League. And the girls that had more ambition, and obviously the league, this brought the level down uh, immensely in Belgium. Um, mm-hmm. The girls that had more ambition at that point were thinking, okay, no, I have to go to another country because this is way less competitive now. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of when that movement started for, for us, I think. Okay. Is it is it is it just a coincidence that when a Belgian team wins the league that they they completely fold the league? Or what what's going on there? <laughs> that's a theory, yeah. That's a theory. Okay. But, uh, There's a conspiracy here. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, it was heartbreaking for us. We thought, what are you kidding? And at the same time, our coach was saying that he was leaving. Um, he was leaving the team. Um, yeah, it was it was a bit weird we don't really understand how it happened i think the netherlands wanted to stop it mm-hmm. and then they came back on back on their decision like a couple months later and then belgium said no like you said no at first so so no which mm. is a bit stupid as well so i think on both sides there was a bit of a yeah. weird but- yeah, it Makes could sense. be that they they were hurting their ego that a Belgian team won. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm just I'm just it's, saying it sounds like it to be honest. Yeah. And uh I mean that's incredible about like you said about the national team because it seems like it was never on your radar. Was it was it ever a thought like oh I want to play for the national team one day or it kind of no, just happened? Not. Actually when I was I mean I guess you know I don't regret anything but I was in the, I was selected for the under 19th national team for a while. Mm-hmm. so when back when I was playing in white star and it mm-hmm. really I I kind of hated it like I oh really okay the girls were great and stuff the coach was it was a woman um Anne her name was and yeah she was quite tough like she had you know tough love sort of thing mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm joining into a group with girls again that were together in in all the other age groups and it's mostly Dutch um at this point i i don't know how to speak dutch uh some of them they're speaking, speaking dutch yeah they speak so it's flemish okay. in belgium you've got, yeah. you got french the south is french the north is flemish which is a, a, a type mm-hmm. of dutch and then mm-hmm. uh, you've got the middle brussels which is supposed to be both languages but it's mostly french okay um so yeah i didn't really i didn't really like it at all and i ended up like skipping um skipping a tournament actually and instead i went skiing so that was where <laughs> this wasn't was the euros I, was it no i went to the year i went to okay. the um i went to the under 19s euros that was in switzerland that was that mm. was a, a cool experience but no there was another it was a game or a, or a camp i think it was a camp and i okay. said no i'm going skiing with my friends Okay, you didn't even wow. make up another excuse. It was, it was, I'm skiing. Oh, no, yeah, that was my, where my mindset w- was at that age. I, mean, I was mm-hmm. 17, 18 years old, and I, and I really, because I didn't feel comfortable, I guess I, I just wanted to do things and, and have fun and not be somewhere where I'm, where I'm not comfortable. Mm-hmm. So I ended yeah. up just saying, like, after that, I just ended up saying, I don't want to, I don't want to do this, and I'd rather leave my, my spot to someone who really wants to be there. Because at that time, I, I, I didn't, I didn't want to be there. 
Yeah, that so makes yeah, sense. Though. Like, the national team was really not on my radar, especially having had that experience. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that year, I, I thought I'll never be in the A team. Like this is <laughs> not after not after right the after ski that. trip. Was no, it a no, good ski yeah, trip? Thought, okay, I'm on a blacklist, you know, so I'm never gonna get. <laughs> I'll never be selected. I said no to you guys. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Lo logical thinking. Yeah. So, yeah Where'd you go skiing? Um, south, uh, South France, in the Alps, in French Alps. Awesome. Yeah. So that's that second oh, time around was. Awesome. was... <laughs> Say again. It was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. Okay. Oh, well, at least it was I a good ski trip. Three, yeah. About three, three, four years <laughs> running, like that was a thing every year. So. Perfect. That second time around, though, with the national team, um, you're a bit older, you're a bit more experienced. Was the culture also different within the national team? So you were able to kind of, I guess, fit in more or just feel more comfortable and more yeah, able to do your job? Like I was I was definitely different. And I already, I of course, felt comfortable because a lot of the team were my teammates uh, with whom we were having an amazing season. and. A few of them ended up like still now being being quite good friends and 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 yeah at that point it was a whole different it was a whole different ball game it was a whole different uh, feeling that I had mm -hmm. I f it yeah it felt way more comfortable definitely it was not going to go on a ski trip um, it was yeah there was no my focus, thoughts of that. <laughs> my focus was 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 on on football right. so I read I read with the men's team is that they usually um or I think always try and speak English because of the different languages and they don't want to favor one. Was it the same at this age where it was English or is it a bit different? Well, again, that was probably a downfall. Again, it was a lot of Dutch, mm -hmm. a lot of, so in Belgium, I would say the North side, the, the Flemish part, uh, invested way more into sports in general. Mm -hmm. And so that meant, way more into into women's women's sports and women's football mm -hmm. and so the development the players coming out well obviously there were more um more apt players higher abilities uh, higher level uh, on the north side so that made for a national team that was composed mostly of of uh, flemish uh, flemish girls mm -hmm. i think the most French speaking at, at one time was maybe, maybe we, there were four of us okay. out of like a 20, 23 player group. So mm -hmm. that makes a small, small percentage wow. of French speaking. And I my was... Dutch at that point was still quite bad. And so, yeah, I would, I would speak in English. The problem was also that the coaches French and English wasn't that good. So our communication mm -hmm. was very limited, which mm -hmm. for me, like I, I put a lot of importance into communi communicating with people mm -hmm. and that kind of limited our, our relationship. So especially on a national team, you would just wouldn't. I mean, I guess for us, uh, you know, it just wouldn't even be a thought like that communication would be tough playing for your home country. I think that's such a unique thing with with Belgium that there's just it, so I, I'm curious, too. So when you're growing up, are people from the north learning French in school too, or or and people from the south learning Flemish, or these things are they kind of not at war with each other, but is there are they kind of at odds with each other with which is going to be the most spoken? I think it will depend on where you are, um, okay. but I would say in a general, and this is bad for my <laughs> um, uh, for my side, so the south side. Um, it's mostly the, the Flemish speaking uh, community speaks better French than the French community speaks Flemish for sure. Okay. Okay. That's, I see. What, that's my experience. And you, I mean, and you learn yeah, this in school? We'll back that up. Hmm. Um, and you learn this in school? So yeah, you learn it in school, but I, I didn't even choose Flemish in school. I didn't choose okay. Dutch in school, which was bad for me, but because I was in, in this international, um, school well it was a Belgian school but we had a choice to, to choose German or Dutch and I when I had to choose I didn't even think I was gonna end up living in Belgium because both my parents are, are not Belgian like 
the rest of my family is like kind of scattered around um, mm-hmm. around Europe mainly. Uh, so I thought, okay, I'll choose German. That's more. That's way more spoken in the world than than Dutch. So why would I choose Dutch? So that kind of um, that kind of limited me as well. That choice, but it's a choice that you make when you're like 12 or 13 years old. So I had no idea. Okay. And then how long? Did, how? Yeah. <laughs> and bisschen, uh, aber yeah. Can't feel forgotten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I actually speak Dutch now when I when I speak uh, when I try and speak German German it's uh, Dutch words that come out so yeah it's quite, there's it's some similar similarities enough. right yeah yeah very similar yeah. ah so cool um so back back to your your incredible season with the Belgium team you guys win the league um do you then leave uh, the country as well amongst all the other great players in the league so I stay. I stayed one more year, um, just to try it. Um, we were getting a, a new coach, and so I thought, okay, I'll stay. I'll stay one more year. Um, but that didn't go well at all. Like I, I don't even. We won the league that year, but sadly, I, I, I can't remember. I can't remember a lot from that season. It, it wasn't good. I, I didn't get along well with the coach. Um, I mean, not, I mean, I got along well, but didn't really get his, it it kind of felt like he was there just to rebound, to go to the the men because the standard, that club is, is a, is a huge men's club in the the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the vibe that it it didn't really seem like he, he cared that much. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was just my, my feeling, but. Mm-hmm. It didn't feel good, and I know uh, other players in the team didn't really feel good, especially the players that were there the year before, which was like completely different level. Mm-hmm. So after that season, I thought, okay, what do I want to do? What do I want to what do I want to want to do? And plus, the Euros were gonna were coming up in 2017. So I thought, okay, I want to get better. So I decided to leave. That's that's when I decided to, to look elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And so you go to France, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, so how I did that a, come about? Um, that came about, I have one of my good friends from national team, Janice. She, she actually plays in Lyon right now, Janice Kaiman. Okay. Oh, wow. Massive. Yeah, she, yeah. yeah. Um, she, play, she had been playing in France for, for a few years. Mm-hmm. And one of our old teammates, I had met, uh, some of her teammates and one of her old teammates was going to was playing in Marseille in second division mm-hmm. and they were going up into first division so I contacted her uh, just to see what was possible and and ended up going I had a job at that point I was working at another job in a kindergarten school um, and I just ended up like taking a day off and going down to Marseille testing uh like just practicing so they can see no one no one knew me like you, french girls like french um french competition had no have no idea about belgian players so mm-hmm. i did this test and they they really liked me and they offered me a contract and then i took the train back up to, to after Brussels. one day I worked the next day <laughs> wow yeah, what did you did, did did you tell your students <laughs> uh not my students but yeah my colleagues and stuff they were there was okay. this one one of the guys was, was a huge like om uh, om fan so he was like whoa my god oh he's probably so yeah he's so excited <laughs> yeah. that's so, amazing yeah, i didn't actually realize uh, how om i didn't actually realize how many actually belgians are such fans of of, of marseille and how big that that club is in in many many um, many people's minds here. I had no idea mm-hmm. until I I signed there, and the mm-hmm. first pictures were coming out, and they were like, "Oh my god, that's crazy! Oh, she plays at, at OM, blah blah blah." That was a um, yeah, it was a huge realization for me. I, I had no idea. Just is I, that a thing in is that a thing right. in Belgium where they follow uh, like the French league or the the league in Netherlands a bit more than the league in Belgium? depending yeah, on well, where you live. Real, I think real football fans would also follow the, the, the Belgian league, but 
but yeah, they definitely follow France, at least France. I would say France more than the more than the the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Just it's a bigger league as well. Big, big historical clubs, and I mean, you, you do in the Netherlands as well, but on my side, I guess on more more so on the French part of Belgium. Right. They would be like either P- huge PSG fans or huge uh, Marseille fans. Mm-hmm. So this transition from from Belgium playing at Standard and then going to France and playing for Marseille, did you feel such a different in terms of the level of the club, whether it be just the facilities, the teammates, the training, the coaches, the fans? Was it a huge step for you? Yeah, it was. I think more so because the league was way more competitive. Um, mm-hmm. The teams that we would play against were were stronger. Our team was good. Like we, they recruited ten players that season. Mm-hmm. Um, players that came from from good clubs like Montpellier, for example, which was a, a big club for girls and still mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the group was great. The coach was was I don't even know how to describe him. He was so in, inspiring, but like. Yeah, I never really had a coach like that. He was very like perfectionist. I'd okay. never really had that, mm-hmm. which um, helped me a lot. I learned so much from him um, in the sense of like, I, I'd never been a tactical player really. Like I, okay. I, I, I'd never until this point, of course I'd pay attention to tactics, but I don't know, my, my, my brain was more, okay, I'll do it by instinct sort of. And he mm-hmm. sort of opened this door to this this world of this tactical world of football, and in a way, because he he was so perfectionist, he he used words that I that I would understand, and that really helped my my game, especially as a as a midfielder. Mm-hmm. So yeah, really learned a lot, and we ended up finishing uh, fourth that season, which was an incredible achievement. Wow. Um, and he got like he got the prize for best coach of the season. Oh, cool. um, yeah, it was a huge season for us. Mm-hmm. And we the best part was beating we beat PSG at, at wow. in Marseille, so at home. And Sick. we were talking about the fans, and that was when we really felt it. Actually, is when we play teams, especially PSG, because there's this mm-hmm. huge rival between the two teams. Right. Mm-hmm. And so loads of fans came to watch that game, loads of them, and we beat them 2-0. Um, I scored, I scored one goal that season, and it was the one. Amazing! Oh, that's <laughs> great. What was the so, celebration? That whole, yeah, that was. <laughs> I mean, actually, we thought we were gonna like party until the end of the like until morning, but we actually all tired around midnight. We were all dead. So we yeah, that happens sometimes. These tough games. You're like, oh, in our, I'm in done. Our mind, it was, in our mind, it was crazy, but no. We didn't. Uh, <laughs> we didn't really party that, that hard, actually. After. Um, so back back to your your midnight party ending. Um, how was the how was the transition into France? Uh, living there culturally, uh, football, but also outside of football. Um, it was quite tough, uh, to be honest. I at that time, I'm 27. I basically have all my life in Belgium. My friends, my uh, my, my parents uh, are here, and so it's all a, it's all that I know at that point. And it's quite. I felt like, in retrospect, was quite a late age to to actually go and move to another country alone. Mm-hmm. Um, so at first, I I guess I had that feeling of um, of being homesick and and stuff. Um, but then I, one of the girls from the team that actually came from Montpellier lived like right by me and she was also having those types of uh feelings like she she wasn't that far from home she was like a couple hours but it was still like her first time quite far away um and so we we got to talking and that's when things sort of changed for me and then started going out more with the with the girls seeing them outside of football and and that that really helped definitely you feel um, like being comfortable with the teammates and and people like this helped your performances on the field? Yeah, definitely. There's definitely a link. Um, if you're not feeling well, for sure, for sure, your performances are, are, are less are less good. I think you need mental stability, emotional stability. I think that's really important. 
that's probably things in, in certain teams and or sports teams in general that aren't really worked on enough. And yeah, yeah it should be an essential part of, of training, actually. Hmm. Sure, sure. And uh, at that time, was your French, was it already fluent or did you think it improved while you were in France? No, my French, my French is fluent. We went since I went to a, to a Belgian French school. Mm -hmm. um, so my French is actually probably better than, than my English because I, I went to school in French. Okay. And studied uh, later on uh, in French as well. So, wow. So, you know, at that time, my French is. Your English is impeccable. I can't imagine how good your French is. <laughs> did you uh did you learn english in school as well or your mother is also english so did you no, speak my that mom, at home oh yeah my my mum is english my mum's british she's okay. scottish she was born in scotland and uh and she lived in england so yeah okay. that's why we spoke english at home got it got it so, awesome yeah, yeah um so you played you played the season with marseille you guys did really well finished up fourth did you sign again for the next season? No, no. I felt at the end of the season, I felt um, I still felt a bit far from home. And at the same time, uh, PSV in the Netherlands uh, mm -hmm. called me, so Eindhoven, uh, where they were interested. And I thought, OK, this could be a, a good, um, how would you say, a, a good compromise for me because Eindhoven is like, an hour and a half, two hours from Brussels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and it's still quite a good level. So I thought, okay, I, I think, I feel like this is a good option. It's a bit closer to home, but it's still, you know, my own thing. And I still have my football um, career and I'm not playing in Belgium, which at the time is still really, really shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> really, really <Yeah>. shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to, to give it blunt. <laughs> Yeah. This whole this this whole this whole time, are you working with an agent or are you representing yourself in, in everything? No, I'm representing myself. <laughs> I mean, because I was late in thinking, okay, I can have an actual professional career. I never like the thought was never in me to have an agent. <laughs> mm -hmm. So right. which would, would have helped me definitely looking back. Mm -hmm. Would have helped me do a lot of things like negotiate i suck at negotiating things so it's, it's not in which way are you are you too harsh like, or are you okay, too like okay I'm give worth, me whatever oh yeah i'm like okay oh wow i'm getting paid to play football yes okay whatever you give me i'll take okay. <laughs> never <laughs> asking for more yeah or ha being really really scared to ask for more like really nervous before those mm. types of meetings and i right. think that definitely where uh, an agent is essential if if for, for sport development professional sport development and agents are yeah yeah I, it's it's nice because you don't have to talk about those things like you yeah. don't want to talk about those things and then feel like okay i'm damaging my my um relationship with the club in some way where like yeah. my agent he or she can just you know be the bad guy be the bad yeah. guy and be like, no, we deserve more money and I'm just here to play. It's, it's, it w was it difficult to juggle those kinds of things of um, having the stress of these or what's my next opportunity or what's my contract, but then also having to play. There's a lot of juggling going on. I found it difficult. I found it difficult. Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, basically almost in, incapable at this time of like selling myself mm -hmm. saying oh yeah i'm not like i'm worth way more than that i'm i'm so good blah 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 like i can't really say things like that without mm -hmm. feeling really weird and awkward about it right so yeah it's tough to juggle that it's it's tough also because it's still women's football it's something that still has to develop so much and um clubs a lot of clubs are reluctant to to, to give more if they're mm -hmm. not giving that much to other players they're reluctant to give more like it's it's not it's not at all the same as as for men i think it's yeah you, you don't really feel legitimate when you're actually talking and asking for things you feel like oh i'm asking for too much like they i, I kind of got that feeling quite a lot in these in these types of negotiations mm -hmm. where it was Did oh you're asking for a lot 
uh, and I'm like, well, no, I'm asking for like a hundred more euros. Is that like how is like that? you can't afford work? this, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, so, in P uh, at PSV, were you speaking uh, Dutch there, or was it mostly in English? Uh, how how was the language there? So yeah, that was more. These were the years. So I stayed three seasons at PSV, mm. and this is where I learned most of my Dutch. Okay. Um, I was still, yeah, I learned, I learned quite a bit in national team because as I said, the, the coach was, was mostly Dutch speaking. And so that meant team meetings were usually in Dutch. So my football vocabulary, vocabulary was quite, quite okay already, mm -hmm. but then socially, I guess I learned my social Dutch more, more in PSV. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, the year that I arrived in PSV, they opened the door to, to quite a lot of other foreigners. And so it would def it would definitely be half English, half half Dutch. Mm. So I'd still speak quite a lot of English. Right. And uh, this is where you met uh, Kim de Caesar. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So for everyone out shout there, out this is Kim. how. Shout out to Kim. This is how this conversation happened. Um, was she the first American player that you played with? Uh, yeah, she was the first. And then the same season, another player, Samantha Widerman, uh, came. But yeah, okay. Kim was the first American player. And before yeah. you, um, before she came, did you have um, like an idea of America? Because at the time, the national team, uh, or they still are, but they were very strong in the world. Did you have like a, was there like a stereotype of what American players are like? Or, you know, did you have an idea of what she was going to be before she came i mean i i was for sure she was going to be like something from another world i think okay because, because from from afar as women uh football soccer players we yeah the states is a huge example for for us so knowing that this girl comes from the states played at duke played um played in the in the in the national league um, I was like, oh my god, <laughs> this is gonna be. <laughs> and effectively, it was like it was, it was a crazy encounter. Like, okay, on a personal level, yeah, we, we're still really good friends. Like, and and I think that'll that'll stick for mm -hmm. for the rest of our time here on on Earth. So that that's pretty cool. But also, but on a purely football sports level, it was a crazy encounter. Like. The, the way that the US, I guess, invest themselves, um, or her in particular, but after I played with Sam, I played with a few others in the, in the other seasons, it, it all seems to come from the same thing. It's like the way that they work out, that you mm -hmm. like take care of yourself, think of sports, like the whole, the whole mentality around it, it for me is different than, than Europe. And I learned so much from Kim. I learned so much right. from Kim. Right on that level like she loves to to go lift like she yeah. she has these like um when we had to do planking like all the girls like especially dutch girls a lot of them they they really they they hate the the physical training part mm -hmm. i was okay i was more like uh okay some days i like it sometimes i don't but kim was like in love with it she and we would do like these uh, group planks things and she would be okay who wants to who wants to talk now who has something to say let's let's talk while planking and everyone's like oh my god what the hell <laughs> that's such that's a big crazy American. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this is such an effort and she was just like okay who has a planking uh, subject blah 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 <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was very it was like a totally different way of um right. of working out and that really that got me into it like now yeah, I think she, yeah that helped me a lot. Like now, even without football, I, I I'm really into working out and stuff, and that's definitely her. Wow, that's awesome! Another shout out to Kim. Great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I remember speaking to her about it when she first went over to Europe after a few seasons. She was saying that like the athleticism part of it helped her a lot because she that's how, that was always part of her game, even in America. But then, yeah. like she goes to Europe and everyone is just so technical. Like yeah. they're so good on the ball but she also stands out she's not as good on the ball but she's just an athletic beast she's very tall yeah, she not good stop. in the air and mm. you know it kind of Probably balances so it fit. out yeah right mm -hmm. exactly 
yeah, she would say it herself, like te technically it wasn't her, her strong point, but she would, she would make up for it like mm -hmm. 10 times over because she would just not stop. She would not mm -hmm. stop. She would always be there. She would always be an option. Like you say, she's great in the air. She's great in challenges. Mm -hmm. And yeah, she would just not stop. And that's due to her physical ability. And that's due to training, to training yeah. and, and having that, that mindset, mm -hmm. which was right. really inspiring. Yeah. So back to the team experiences with, with PSV, how were those first few seasons um, in terms of level, in terms of the group and, and how you guys did in the league? Yeah, so here the level, I would say the first season was a bit, I guess the level was a bit less than France. At this point, there are eight teams in the league. Mm -hmm. I would say three, maybe four uh, can compete for the top top spots. And, and then four were not as good, just developing um, new teams, things like that. So that would make it a bit less, the level a bit less high than um than the france level but the the investment in the girls clubs especially at psv you could see there was a real opening um to progress and throughout those three seasons i really saw a difference in a progression in in each season uh the first season i think we finished third third or fourth maybe I can't remember. Um, and then the second season, we were second, if I'm not mistaken. And then the last season, which was the COVID season, uh, we were first and we were on to, we were definitely, I mean, I can't say that we would have won if it hadn't stopped for COVID, but we... You were in a position to at least. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah we, it, was, it was, we had a great team. So, so yeah, seeing... Yeah. Mm. so seeing from i mean from the beginning of your career towards the ender the ender points of your career seeing that difference in investment in women's soccer um did that mean a lot to you to see how far it was coming yeah it did um definitely but at the same time uh like my last few seasons i also like sort of open my eyes to, to certain realities. And that was, that was also with Kim and Sam and these, these, these girls arriving from, um, from countries where it's way more developed. Um, it opened my eyes to, to how slow it's going as well. Mm -hmm. right. and so I started, I maybe too late, I don't know, but at the same time, I can't really change that. But I started like um, talking, talking about it, going to, to the clubs and trying to, to negotiate things, to discuss things for the team and for women's football and, right. and sort of starting to speak out about it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely happy to see that there's progression. I'm happy to, to realize, cause I'm sure it's not gonna stop now. Like I can imagine in five years, it's gonna be totally different. But for me, there's still a lot of like injustice that mm. Still so far to come. Yeah. Yeah, we should have spoken out. I feel like maybe should have spoken out more about it, but mm -hmm. yeah, at the same time, there's always this fear and like where's my place and what am I actually gonna mm -hmm. talk about? And mm -hmm. it's it's quite a complicated complicated position um right. to be in, but yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about um you said you were talking to clubs, was it you were talking to PSV or you were talking to other clubs and is this something that you still do now? As, as for speaking out about... Yes, um, for, for speaking out. Can, yeah, I would love to just talk yeah, a little so bit more about this. It would be the club. So PSV, definitely, like the last two seasons. And I would... Yeah, we we'd made this committee of players where, where we would discuss things and things that are going well and trying to, try to you know, talk to the, the, the managers about things that should be like better for girls and mm. that was received quite well but again it sometimes felt weird having to ask for it yeah like, like just weird things like having access to the gym and stuff like that things that feel like should be like normal things but we have to ask for them so that was a bit 
but still that's a sign of progression because they were open to it and hearing now how it's going is is already completely different than how it was when I was there so and it's not that long ago right mm -hmm. also my last club that I went to after PSV so where I ret retired uh, last year um that's I also spoke to them so it's the clubs that I that I played in basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the end of of my career so i'd say right. these last three these last three years where i really found actual words and confidence to go speak to the the higher ups mm -hmm. about about what is negative right it's quite hard to you know it's like the can we talk and you know answer right we have to talk <laughs> right you know, it's also but, a difficult position when you're not when you're a bit maybe a younger player you know to be the pioneer to go to the club and say hey we want this, this, and this, and they'll yeah. say, okay, we'll leave the team, you know? Yeah, so it's, exactly. it comes with age or maybe a leadership Experience, role where yeah. you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely people. came with age. And seeing, like, last season in, in the Belgian team, I was in a team with, I think the average age was, like, 19, and two of us were over 30. So they were all, like, between 16 and, and 19 years old. Wow. And it, that also got me thinking about them and how you know I know I'm stopping I know that the time you know have leading a, a great life like financial security and stuff that won't be for me but but I I I want it to be for them I want right. it to be for them. so it was yeah definitely gave you more more confidence to to speak out when you're speaking out for people and not just for yourself right right it's bigger than yourself yeah. And did you ever have uh, any thoughts or, or dreams to go to the U.S. and play? Because for um, us coming from America, it would like for Dylan and I, it's always like we got to get to Europe. But I'm wondering <laughs> if for, for women, it's the opposite. Like, oh, I would love to go to America and play. I mean, my dad kind of had that dream <laughs> for me, I think. Um, I, I thought about it, I think, because he said, OK, you know, go study in the States. Like you could definitely mm. get a scholarship. And I'm, I'm pretty sure now, knowing the system a bit better now, that I, I could, could, could have probably got a, a, a quite a good scholarship in a, in a good right. school. Mm -hmm. But no, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't think about it. I didn't, it wasn't something that I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not general. I know some girls definitely want it because football is such a huge thing for girls over there so mm -hmm. right another another um tough subject is always hanging up the boots so i just kind of want to touch into how difficult of that was it how difficult of a decision that was and being at your last club and just did you know it was the right time were you feeling it or is it something that you still kind of think about no i'm, I'm pretty sure it was uh, it was the right time um, what was difficult definitely was the moment of making the decision. Like I had a, I had quite an even list of of pros and cons. Mm. Um, what probably weighed in in the balance was the fact that the contracts we had an amazing season. Um, we finished second when the year before they had finished last, so we like exceeded expectations. And what they were offering. Um, for me and for us um, to stay was was not for me it was the same sort of contract and even in some regards it, it felt like it was less um, mm. and that kind of that's when I actually had a, a a discussion with the club just to say what what are you doing like again not only about myself but this represents you're, you're making these steps um, into women's football, what you have to, you have to go all in. You can't step forward and then two steps back. Mm -hmm. And I, and I had like this monologue for like five minutes. And that's when I actually made my decision was, okay, no, I'm not doing this. This is too tiring. It's tiring me physically, definitely, but it's tiring mentally as well because you have to start thinking about, you know, putting money aside, thinking about life, thinking about job security. And those are things that you can't really get yet. And it's mm -hmm. not, it's not especially the club. I know it's not the club's fault. And it's especially not the, the guys that I talk to. It's not their fault either, because they're not making these decisions. Right. It's the system that that has to evolve as well. 
Um, I think the only example, well, no, there are other examples, but the main example in Europe is Lyon. Lyon has that, had this guy at one point, he went all in and he thought, okay, we're investing into women's football, whether it's a risk or not, because it is a risk. It is a risk, uh, financially speaking. If you're, if you're in finance um, and you're just like, you're maybe just a robot thinking of numbers and stuff, it's a huge risk to invest in something that doesn't bring you money in the first years, but you want it to, to develop. So you, you, you know, you're taking a risk. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, people, clubs, men's clubs are reluctant to do that, even though they have the, the money and the budget to, to, to do more. Yeah. Like right. you said, it, it's, it seems like in, in some of these leagues in England, I know the, um, the investment is coming, starting from the men's team, but it seems too late and there's still so, so yeah. far we need to come. Um, is there, is there some things that you think can be done in, in, in the, um, in the present time in the short future where that can really help not even just from, from from these clubs but i guess from from football fans and and players alike yeah i would say i would say speaking out more i guess i guess that's something that is starting to come out especially with the like through social media and stuff you see teams yeah you see teams sort of how do you say um yeah just saying what's going wrong like open you know putting numbers up there saying how much they earn and maybe make it a bit more public so people realize um the, these types of issues because i think people don't really realize it like i didn't realize it for years because i was like oh it's football like it's it's a sport it's for fun uh, it's passion but then slowly it came to me like uh, no like should be getting more we're not getting as much as we give so oh, yeah. i think something that that should be done more definitely by players but also by 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 supporters if they if they realize um what's going on then yeah just or or maybe more support from them than them then like just come to see our games come to see women not only in football in in other sports as well Mm -hmm. it's something that's common to 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 a lot of uh to a lot of women's sports so yeah, yeah I guess sure. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to talk about uh, a bit of what you've been doing outside of, uh, of football um, in terms of the work in developing nations uh, with football. Uh, could you give us a bit of insight in that? I know you studied in Senegal, correct? I didn't know. So I studied in Belgium. Belgium, um, okay. To, yeah, I, for my thesis, I decided to right. join my, my two occupations at the time which was football okay. and i was doing a master's in population development okay mm-hmm. and so i decided to do my thesis about um team sports and how they can help communities in in west africa mm-hmm. and so that's how i ended up going to senegal and um did an internship there but actually in the end it wasn't the internship that helped me for my thesis it was i i wanted to continue playing so I found a team in Dakar, which was actually the, they were the champions of Dakar, of uh, Senegal. And it was just to stay fit and to still continue playing. But I actually learned way more from, from playing with those girls for, for a couple of months than, um, than my internship. And I also wow. lived with a family. Like I went through this, um, this nonprofit that um, it's like, it's called, Tourisme solidaire. So you, you go and you live with a family. And so you, you pay directly to the, to the family. And that was also something that was amazing because you see like the insides of, you're not staying in this big hotel or in these apartment buildings. You're mm. actually staying in this house with like 20 people. Mm, and they were wow. like in the same family. And it was very right. eye opening. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're, you're right in it. Um, what, what are some of the things that you 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 stress the the things that you learned playing with the girls teams and how much more you learned there? Can you touch on some of those things that you learned? Um, I think it was the love, the love and the passion they have for the game with having very mm. very little. 
-hmm. would practice in these um it was like a sand pit but to the sides it was like very deep sand and as you would get to the middle of the pitch you could uh, you could feel the cement under your under your feet mm. so you'd see the, the the context in which they're they're playing but the intensity and the, the the love that they they have and the passion that they have that they don't you know they don't they don't care where they play it's just as a ball there's a group we had practice every day mm -hmm. every day of the week like sometimes they give us off on sunday but it was every day of the week they're not getting paid for it um yeah i just found something there i i some of them didn't speak french but we still bonded on just because there was a ball mm -hmm. and just because we we know how to give a pass or score a goal like it, it was it was incredible it felt like going back to basics mm -hmm. we tend to forget as as you go get higher in in in, in the level i guess as you mm -hmm. get more professional we tend to forget those basics which are the group which are sharing sharing something together um and i think yeah i got back to those those basics mm -hmm. all the while That's amazing. discovering like how yeah how life is over there and how how good you have it how good we have right. it humbling experience yeah to say the least yeah. it seems like yeah. and how long did you live there for uh two months and a half two months and a half wow yeah and, and so about... to touch... yeah, go go ahead, on. you got it <laughs> i was just going to say to touch on uh, parts with your i mean we don't have to go too deep into your thesis but i would love to to talk about some of those findings or re revelations between how sport can really impact social relations and and how do you feel like that experience can impact in in, in other social settings yeah, well, I mean, I basically discovered things that I already kind of figured. Mm -hmm. But I fell, I came upon this uh, thing that's called the Navitan in Senegal. It's this, uh, it's a local competition. Okay. And like parallel to actually the National League. But this thing, it starts like very locally. So in your neighborhood, so maybe a couple of neighborhood teams play against each other. Mm -hmm. And then it goes to a provincial, then regional, and then it ends in this uh, final, like national tournament. But again, it's not the it's not the national league. So I quickly discovered that there this thing is so it's so much in the heart of um, of neighborhoods of of these of Senegal. Like everyone was part, everyone is part of these organizations, uh, which. It, it is centered around football, but there's also some some neighborhoods that have basketball. Some some of them have theater, and basically, when there's a game in your neighborhood, like the whole community would get together to like clean up the neighborhood, try and tr like clean up the streets. Uh, some people would like cook things or bring drinks or try and raise uh -huh. money to go and get. And so everyone would like activate themselves around this and that was basically what what i i guess kind of figured but was not expecting to find this like gem of a of a thing that was like this whole right. organization mm -hmm. that in the end <clears throat> more people go see these games when they're in like the regional finals and stuff than actually in the stadiums where the clubs play wow Which, uh, yeah it's and like the the um, older players, like more ancient, like there's a huge, of course, respect for 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 the el elderly and and the most respected are these these um, legends of of these games. Mm. So when I oh, had okay. to find someone to talk to and interview, they would send me to these guys that were these these ancient legends of of like football legends, but in their own community like, from these they, games. Yeah. Wow. So I think that would that is what represents most of my discovery is that yeah amazing do you, do you see that um I've I read that you just wanted to to kind of explore this subject more um I believe you said I've seen firsthand how sports can impact lives and would love to work on projects that use the power of sports to make this world a better happier 
and peaceful place. Have you been able to use any of those things to, to uh, apply into another region or do you have hopes to do this in the future? Yeah, that's, that's the hope, definitely. I, I think I've put my university degree on hold for, for too long because of this football career. Okay. And I definitely <laughs> want to go into that. I, I'm actually working on a project with a friend of mine who, um, she's, she works with this uh, women's team, so for homeless women. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is a friend with whom I worked when I was working in the women's shelter. Mm-hmm. And at that time, we had actually started a team um for these women and she Mm -hmm. actually continued that uh for these past years and it got quite big because there's a thing called the homeless cup in belgium and and in in different countries as well and they they organized she went to the world cup like the world homeless cup and things like that and we're working on a project to to start our own um our own nonprofit um with the same type of basis so directed at these women um, but also their children. So oh, mm-hmm. we're working on something like that, and and I think it's gonna it's gonna become a bit more concrete in the in the coming uh, months. So it's still so, yeah. still in the developing stages, or is there a name or anything? Because we would love to to plug and get this out as much as we can. I think it's um, an amazing idea. We have a name, but I I'm not gonna disclose it yet because um, yeah, fair enough, not, yeah. Not <laughs> officialized yet, but it, when it's official, I mean, I I'll, I'll definitely communicate it to you. Please, awesome. yeah. It sounds sure. amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, now, Sarah, here at Footwork, we like to, I mean, the podcast is kind of, you know, talking to people like yourself uh, who make their own path and do things maybe that's a bit against the grain. Um, what does make your own path mean to you? Um, so against the grain, well, I guess being a woman, a woman in football in Belgium, um, in, for my gen- generation, mm-hmm. it was definitely against the grain um yeah i guess that's quite a hard question (laughs) (laughs) let's let's i guess that i kind of uh i think you could have done a little more explain i think you could have done a little more explain you threw it Um, out what maybe what advice would you give to not necessarily your younger self um but say you know a 16 year old girl looking to pursue their own path in something, what advice would you give to them? It doesn't have to be football. I think if you believe in it, I mean, it's going to sound really corny, but if, yeah, you got to listen to yourself. And if you feel like that's where you have to be, just just do it, just do it 100%. And regardless of what people say, but at the same time, listen to what people have to say and answer answer them, like, because people will have maybe a negative image if it's really going, you know, completely against the grain. That basically means, yeah, society hasn't really accepted it yet. But do listen to what they have to say and try and find your answer to what they have to say. That'll help you move mm-hmm. forward as well. Um, don't ignore, don't ignore people that have negative things to say because they're, they're saying it because they're, they're a part of society, which you grew up in as well. But yeah, just, just, yeah, react, uh, listen to what people have to say, listen to the positive things as well, like, like take it all in and, 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 and try and figure out with all those components where you want to go from there and what, what your inner you is actually saying to you. So yeah, I don't think there was, like there was, I don't think there was anything corny about that at all. No? Okay. That was, no, that was great. the opposite of corny. <laughs> amazing like my first words was like believe in yourself that's like something you could read on a, <laughs> a, a fortune cookie yeah <laughs> so until next time keep moving forward keep learning make your own path there you go thank you sarah it's a pleasure footwork is sponsored by ourselves also kong fitness and merchant designs baby follow us on instagram at footwork underscore podcast twitter is at Footwork Podcast. YouTube and Facebook, just check out Footwork Podcast, search it. Email us if you need anything, any questions at footworkpodcast at gmail.com. And remember, plug, plug, pass. Tell your parents, Amazon delivery guy, mailman, I don't know who, just tell them. Like, subscribe, review, all of it helps. Danke.